Welcome to the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, a program dedicated to uncovering the unified nature of reality and humanity's ever-evolving place as truly galactic beings. For more information on the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome to the Science of Magic, a place where science and magic come together to transform fact into evolving truth. We're coming to you through the X-Zone Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. We can also be found on www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, we'll be exploring plant helpers. There are virtually as many shamanic cultures on the planet as we have nationalities. One of the many things they all have in common are foundations firmly rooted in herbology, uh, no pun intended. Having studied many shamanic practices from around the world, my education includes strong medical intuitive skills as well as a formidable body of knowledge on the use of plant helpers to correct imbalances that lead to sickness and disease of the body, emotions, mind, or soul. From mullein root and garlic tincture for ear infections to bear root for lung congestion, I've supported my children's health from birth to the present day using herbs and natural remedies. However, I am not an herbal Nazi. While our plant helpers are gentle, balanced corrections, they can indeed work miracles. They are very refined. Our world has become extremely polluted and coarse. Years ago, what used to take a gentle nudge to regain balance now may require something akin to a nuclear bomb. Our daughter was 18 months old when suddenly one evening she developed a deep cough. After only a couple of hours, it worsened dramatically. Imagine my husband's amazement when instead of brewing one of my concoctions, I yelled at him, warm the car, we're going to children's hospital now. It didn't sound that bad to him, yet. We spent the next week in the croup room of the hospital fighting for her life. She was on steroids, intravenous antibiotics, oxygen, adrenaline inhalers, and the good Lord only knows what else. I have no doubt that if I would have taken time to try to alleviate or medicate my child without seeking allopathic means, she would have died I'm the founder and director of a Colorado State Certified Occupational School of the Shamanic Arts. In addition to being a shamanic instructor, I'm a preceptor for the University of Colorado School of Medicine, where I instruct doctors on the interface between shamanism and allopathic medicine. Many times my students have asked how I reconcile being a so-called medicine person and interfacing with the allopathic medical system. My answer, you can't shovel poop with a feather. Our sweet, gentle, yet powerful plant helpers were not designed for the degree of imbalance our poor planet and her people are subjected to in these modern times. However, plant teachers continue to be of great value. Personally, I'm so drug sensitive I probably would not be here without them. There's been a ridiculous, needless war going on between herbology and allopathic medicine that hurts many and helps no one. Both modalities have their place, and it's long past time they are not only allowed but encouraged to work together. I believe this dispute is driven by, driven and propagated by economics, not our doctors or our herbologists, with no consideration for the well-being of our people. There are conditions and illnesses that will not resp- respond to herbs, well, at least not in time. The imbalance is just simply too great. There are other and numerous minor imbalances that can be prevented from becoming major ones by the proper, timely, and educated use of quality herbal treatments, reducing the need for overuse of antibiotics and all the problems associated therein. There are also many so-called incurable diseases that have been greatly improved, if not healed, by diet and herbs. All the above require well-trained practitioners to manage them, not some half-cocked, 
overpriced shotgun self-treatment of dubious potency found on the Internet. Every household should be well-versed in CPR, emergical medical treatment, and basic home remedies, and in possession of tried and true texts on all three subjects written by recognized authorities. My guest this hour is one of those authorities. Ellen Everett Hopman is the author of Secret Medicines from Your Garden, Plants for Healing, Spirituality, and Magic. Hopman is the author of a number of books and has been a teacher of herbalism since 1983 and of druidism since 1990. She is a professional member of the American Herbalist Guild and has presented on druid and herbal lore and tree lore. I will introduce Ellen and her formidable body of work after this short break. You are listening to The Science of Magic. This and other innovative episodes can always be found on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. Searching through the night One people, one nation The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Ellen Hopman, the author of Secret Medicines from Your Garden, Plants for Healing, Spirituality, and Magic. www.elleneverthopman.com Ellen, thanks so much for joining us on the Science of Magic. Thank you so much for inviting me. What originally sparked your interest in herbology? Well, um, you know, I'm a product of this culture, and uh, oddly, when I was a teenager, I did have a very intense desire to to know how to go out in the woods and find food, and I wasn't thinking in terms of medicine at that time, but I, there was this nagging feeling that I had in the back of my mind that I had to know how to do this. And it wasn't coming from my school. It wasn't coming from any um, family tradition, although my mother was a gardener. That was about it. But I just had this sense, and I had no idea where to look, of course, uh, for any of this. And uh, later when I was a graduate student, I was at Temple University getting a degree in art history, and um, they sent me to Italy on a scholarship. It wasn't my idea. They they said, you're going to Italy, and you're going to study Renaissance art. And I said, okay, um, <laughs> because I, I really wanted to study photography, but they sent me to, to Rome. And um, make a long story short, I do write about this in great detail in the book, uh, Secret Medicines from Your Garden, but I ended up going to Assisi, Uh, to look at the frescoes of Giotto in the cathedral there. And I was looking at these frescoes, and they're all about the life of St. Francis. They're these medieval uh, frescoes on the wall, and they're covered with gold leaf and gold paint. And something just didn't seem right, because I knew enough about St. Francis to know that he was all about simplicity and being with nature and poverty and all that. So I, I looked around in the cathedral. I 
looked for a priest or a monk, somebody that I could talk to. And I found this little guy in brown robes. He was a Franciscan. I walked up to him and I said, um, you know, how can I find out more about the real St. Francis, how he actually lived? And he said, go to San Maceo. And I said, what is that? And he said, don't ask any questions, just go. And he pointed down the road, so down I went. And I, I just, there was this little wooden sign. It said San Maceo off to the right. On the left was San Damiano, which is the church of St. Clair. And so I followed the sign off to the right, um, walked down this little muddy path through the bushes, came to this clearing, there were all these people lounging around on the grass. It was the middle of the day. Most of them were German. And uh, they said, oh, have you come here to live? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. I didn't even know what the place was. And so they explained that it was a Franciscan community, and they, there were basically people were living in sheepfolds. Um, they were medieval sheepfolds, and there was no hot water. It was just cold water. Uh, the mattresses were straw. Animals were free to go wherever they wanted. There were ducks and chickens wandering in and out of the buildings. Um, bread was baked in a stone oven. Uh, there were gardens. And um, I stayed for a few days. And then I went back to Rome, packed up all my stuff, came back, and stayed for a, a few weeks after that. So I had this kind of mystical experience. Um, we... Every Wednesday you were supposed to fast, spend the whole day fasting, and the only thing you could have was water or herbal tea. And and we had mass twice a day. So uh, one Wednesday um, they told us to just wander in the desert, just go out without any preconceived idea of where you're going or what you're doing, just walk. So I just followed my own feet, and I ended up on top of Mount Subasio, which is a mountain where St. Francis used to go. And while I was up there, there was this huge storm, thunder, lightning, uh, snow. And there, I was above the tree line, so there was nothing up there except grass and one little tiny pine tree. And I wrapped myself around the pine tree, which was pretty stupid, but I didn't know that, because <laughs> it was the only <laughs> other living thing up there. And... Um, when it was over, it passed very quickly. I came down the hill uh, singing at the top of my lungs. And at the bottom of the hill, across from uh, San Damiano, was this little chapel that St. Francis had built with his own hands. And I went in there. It was dark, and, it, and I was the only person in there. It was pre-Gothic, so it was very dark. So I, would, I was for, sitting for, there in for the those dark. Us, excuse me, but for those of us without a Catholic background, would you mind telling us what St. Francis is the saint of? St. <laughs> Francis is actually the patron saint of ecology, believe it or not. Um, he was a guy who used to preach naked, and he used to talk, he would preach to birds. And I like the guy wolves. already. Yeah, well, <laughs> he also considered, <laughs> he considered, you know, he talked about um, brother sun, sister moon, sister fire. You know, he, he considered water to be sacred, fire to be sacred, the moon, the sun. You know, he was totally into nature. And actually, if you want to find out where he got his training, which is something that most people don't talk about, he studied with Hildegard of Bingen. I was going to say, he sounds pretty healthy. shamanic to me. Well, of course. It was very shamanic. <laughs> I mean, he was big into fasting, and he would go into caves and, and eat oatmeal gruel with, with uh, you know, nothing but oatmeal. With maybe He actually would put ashes in there because he didn't want to enjoy it too much. That's very <laughs> Catholic, you know, beat yourself up bad. But, um, <laughs> but he studied with Hildegard of Bingen, who was a, a very interesting woman who doesn't get enough credit. She was a Renaissance woman before the Renaissance. She was trained in a Celtic tradition, Celtic monastic tradition, where men and women live together in, in community. And um, anyway, it's, it's worth it if you look at, um, she wrote poetry, she wrote uh, medical books, she was a doctor, she wrote, I think it was an opera. Um, anyway, and she was in the Celtic tradition which, as if you've ever looked at Celtic tradition, you know is very nature-based. So yeah, that's absolutely. the same principle. Hey, do you harvest your own herbs? 
Yes, I do. I wildcraft a lot, and in the book, um, there's uh, a lot about wildcrafting. Uh, but I, but I, I just want to finish this story very quickly. I went into this chapel that was very dark, and I heard a voice, and the voice said, um, everything you've been doing up until now, which was working on my master's thesis, has been for status and intellect, and to please your parents, you're supposed to be working with plants. And I knew that it was correct. It was this voice that was coming from inside of me and outside of me at the same time. And after that, I just basically gave up everything, all my possessions, sold everything I had, you know, dropped the master's program. Everybody got mad at me. And <laughs> and then I started, started uh, studying herbalism, and then I've been doing it ever since. That's amazing. That's amazing. So to to this day, you are working with herbs, and um, um, I asked, do you harvest your herbs? Do you do that locally? Well, yes. Um, I live in the woods. I live in an oak forest, so there's very little light here. It's not possible for me to have a big herb garden. The only place I can grow anything is right around the house. And that's even hard. So uh, that forces me to go out and, and wildcraft. Uh, I'm very conscious and very careful about the way I do it. There's nothing worse than finding a beautiful stand of something, you know, blue kosh or something like that, and the next year you go back and it's all gone because somebody dug it all up. That just breaks my heart. I even stopped taking people on herb walks for a few years because I was so upset when I saw that happening. Um, yeah, you know, my, my so, background is uh, Native American mostly, and we always uh, ask permission, and we always only take just a little from each plant, not hack the whole thing down. Um, and what's right. scary to me is how quickly our wild and natural herbs are actually disappearing because they That's have right. a way of holding constituents and changing every year to our needs that the domestic ones don't. Do you agree with this? Um, well, the, the, the climate is changing constantly, which kind of uh, means that the plants are going to be changing constantly. I mean, we're in a time of change right now. So um, I'm not a chemist. I can't, you know, I haven't been able to b evaluate what kind of changes are going on in the plants. But what you said earlier, um, it's very important. I was taught, this is actually, I learned this from a Penobscot uh, woman. She said, you walk by the first eight you leave the eighth for the animals, or the, you walk, I'm sorry, you walk by the first seven, you leave the eighth for the animals, and you can take the ninth. And that's very pretty much the same. Pretty much the same policy, huh? Right, because you, I mean, there's a couple of things going on there. You want plants to be available the next year, and they're not going to be there. If you take everything, there's going to be no seeds, there's going to be no propagation, and you won't have anything. Also, the animals need the plants. And everything from the bees and the butterflies to the raccoons and the badgers and the deer, everybody needs these plants. It's not just us, you know, everybody needs the medicines. So we have to be extremely conscious, you know, when we take things. Exactly, work, exactly. You know, do, you, do you supplement your wild harvesting with uh, prepared or imported herbs? Yes, I do, because... Um, I live in New England, and there's a very short growing season. So there are certain things that I run out of. For example, I always have comfrey growing in the yard, very important plant. Everybody should have it. But, again, I can only grow a certain amount. And uh, I, I actually ran out of comfrey That's this winter because I was making so many salves. And uh, I had to order organic comfrey, you know. I mean, sure. Um, I, but I, but in general, I prefer to use things that are local, that grow around me, and I like that's what I like to teach people. And hopefully, when they learn the plants that grow in their own area, and they and when they consciously, very carefully harvest, um, ho hopefully they will appreciate nature. We're going to have to take a quick break. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We will return to our discussion after this short break. You're listening to The Science of Magic. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. You want to hear more? Other innovative episodes can always be found on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net.
The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. We can be found on www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Ellen Hopman, the author of Secret Medicines from Your Garden, Plants for Healing, Spirituality, and Magic. Her website, www.ellenevertthopman.com. Welcome back, Ellen. Hi, thank you. We were just talking about um, uh, wild and natural harvested versus having to import ones to fill in. Um, what's the difference between the two, in, in your opinion? Well, if you're ordering plants from far away, for example, China, India, places like that, um, the plants are going to be irradiated, and they they all have to be irradiated or sprayed in order to get through borders. So I know there are people who like to work with um, plants from China and India and so on, and that's great. But personally, I just it doesn't um, resonate with me. I don't, I don't like that. I prefer organic, um, commercially grown, not necessarily wild-crafted, I mean, because if you buy wild-crafted plants, that's probably somebody who is harvesting a lot of wild plants, and that's getting to be a problem. So the best thing to look for is commercially grown organic. And from, you know, your local area, if you're in Canada, try to buy from Canada. If you're in the U.S., buy from the U.S. That's why, why would I you say that? It. Why? Because then they won't, they won't be irradiated, or, you know, hopefully they won't be sprayed or irradiated, because it's when they cross the international borders that they they try to get rid of all possible pathogens, you know, and they're just not as healthy. Um, and also, it's very important to get to know the plants in your immediate area because I believe, and this is what I tell my students, I think that nature is much smarter than we are, and nature is always trying to give us what we need for example, now, that, was, here in that was exactly what I was looking for, is when it's grown oh. close to where we are, uh, the right. meridians of the earth are aligned with us, and therefore yes. the plants are aligned with us and vice versa. Is that what you're getting to? Well, I'll, t- I'll tell you a story. Here in New England, um, you know, the Lyme disease, uh, epidemic Lyme disease has been around for thousands of years, but we're currently experiencing an epidemic, and I have a lot of different thoughts about it, but... Uh, the epicenter is Lyme, Connecticut. That's where it exploded. Uh, so what happened? There's this plant called Japanese knotweed, which is considered a quote-unquote invasive. And so there are people who get very upset when they see it and they want to hack it out and get rid of it. Well, what happened was, as the Lyme disease progressed, guess what followed? The Japanese knotweed. Guess what's one of the best herbs for Lyme disease? Japanese knotweed. <laughs> so, so I, I mean, I really feel that nature is going, hey, you know, look, you know, here's what you need. So I love it. And here we think we're so yeah, smart, I mean, right? Exactly. We're smarter than nature. That's what, I mean, excuse me, the other way around. 
<laughs> so, so what's your stance on allopathic medicine? Well, I really appreciate what you said um, earlier in the show um, because uh, there's a time to use it and there's a time not to use it. It's fabulous for emergency care. If somebody uh, is having, if someone has a car accident, you know, uh, really bad burns over their whole body, lots of broken bones, uh, or in your case, uh, what was it, whooping cough? What? It was my daughter's daughter. case. It was croup. Croup, okay. Mm -hmm. If it's a really, really serious, acute emergency condition, by all means go to the emergency room. Very important. But where herbs are better is if it's a long-term chronic condition, something that goes on and on and on and on. Um, you know, it could be a low-level thing that goes on for years, some kind of chronic systemic condition. That's where the herbs are actually going to be superior, I think, because our bodies are not really designed to work with the high-powered synthetic medicines for long periods of time. They end up thank thank goodness they're there when you need them. But, you know, my, my, my rule of thumb is start gentle and move to the, to the big guns or start with the big guns and you need them and then back off to what's gentler. And I found that tends to work. You know, I noticed throughout your book you advised your readers to seek professional medical help. And I commend you on being so vigilant and responsible in that regard. Why do you think some people have become so distrustful of our allopathic medical system? Well, like I said, a lot of people are re react to the medicines uh, that they give us. Uh, I think 70,000 people a year die from over-the-counter and doctor-prescribed drugs. You know, it's interesting. The FDA, the, you know, the, goes after herbalists, uh, tries to shut down herbalists. Right? I mean, echinacea was on the hit list at one point. Garlic was on the hit list. You know, they they really go after herbalists. Um, but the fact that 70,000 people a year are dying from complications from regular medicine doesn't seem to be an issue. I uh, know, and, and, I, and I do know it's also very economically based. However, for, you know, let's be the devil's advocate, I've seen a lot of people react to herbal medicines that have been misused out of ignorance and get very, very ill, right. and I've known of several deaths. Okay, well, that's absolutely correct. If you don't know what you're doing, for example, golden seal, I see people abusing golden seal right and left, which is also becoming an endangered species, by the way, because of over-harvesting in the wild. But uh, golden seal is an antibiotic. It's no different than any antibiotic that you're going to get from a doctor. And, I mean, I even knew one person, this is horrible, she took it, her, her quote-unquote practitioner, whoever this was, told her that she needed cleansing and that she should take um, two capsules four times a day for a year. Oh, my and, goodness. You know, uh, I know yeah, how important almost, cleansing is because our world is so toxic. But what most people don't seem to understand is that there is a very specific order that we should be doing cleansing in, and it differs from d disease to disease, and it differs from person to person. Um, hey, did you address that in your book, perchance? Um, well, I mean, I, I try to talk about different herbs and give cautions associated with every herb. And, you know, if you're diabetic, don't do this. If you're pregnant, don't do this. If you have high blood pressure, don't do this. You know, there, there are specific cautions that you need to know about herbs. And there are certain herbs, for example, golden seal, that when you take it, you have to follow up with other things. You can't just take golden seal and then for weeks or months or years and then go on your merry way. You know, you have to follow up. You have to restore your intestinal flora. So I tried throughout the book uh, to do that with every plant that I listed, and I even have a chapter in the back with some basic cautions. But the thing is, this information changes all the time because research is constantly coming out. So if people are going to use a particular herb for a long time, and by that I mean anything more than a week or two, please do your research and see what you know, the latest that, that brings up. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. That, that brings up another question, another burning question. 
because, you know, so far we've really established that nobody has any business going out there buying stuff off the Internet and self-treating with herbs because herbs are a powerful medicinal. On the other hand, how does a person find? I mean, there's not the regulation out there for herbologists. I don't believe that there is for medical personnel. How do we know we're getting good advice, that we're getting a good practitioner? Well, there are ways uh, that people get trained. For example, if someone is a professional member of the American Herbalist Guild, that's pretty reputable. If someone has graduated from a naturopathic school like John Bastier or the National College of Naturopathic Medicine or any of the other genuine certified naturopathic schools uh, that are out there, um, that's a pretty good indication. You know, just make sure that whoever you're working with actually has some training, you know. And all training isn't equal either. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thank you so very much. We're going to have to take another break here. Uh, We will be back on the flip side of this short break. You're listening to The Science of Magic. Our theme song, One People, One Nation, is from the Winds of Time album by my musical group Starfire and can be found on iTunes.com cdbaby.com, amazon.com, and my website, wildawiecka.com. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. We can be found on www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, our special guest is Ellen Hopman, the author of Secret Medicines from Your Garden, Plants for Healing, Spirituality, and Magic. Her website, www.elleneverthopman.com. Ellen, speaking of spirituality... Talk to me about spirituality and herbs. Well, um, the herbs have a spirit, first of all, and as you get to know individual plants, you'll find out that each of them is very different. They have a very different spirit. Uh, For example, uh, sage, most people are very familiar with sage, and cedar are plants that will put you in the frame, proper frame of mind for prayer. I think most people uh, are familiar with those. You burn it, you, or you can even make a tea, um, and it, it helps you if you're uh, going into ceremony. Um, it just puts you in the, in the right frame of mind to communicate with great spirit or your own higher self. Um, that's just one example. Uh, and that's very well put. Bit. You know, of course, uh, being a shaman, I work with with herbs and um, spirituality and ceremony all the time. But there's one thing that I have taken a very strong note of and was taught very strongly is that it's not just the herb. It's the interaction between the intent of the practitioner and the constituent parts of the herb. Can you speak to this? 
Well, you need to have, um, you need to be open, receptive, and humble. And one of the things that I teach and that I write about in the book is the doctrine of signatures, and it's a way of communicating with plants, and you open all your senses, your sense of touch, your sight, um, your sense of smell, even your heart. You open all your senses to a plant, and, and then the plant spirit can enter you and you can enter the plant. So if you need healing or if you want to do healing for somebody else, if you can be in communion with that plant, with that plant spirit, uh, that's when the magic happens, really. It, it's amazing, isn't it? Because it's like um, the way I kind of think of it is a frequency. That um, as, as a shamanic practitioner, I need to be a frequency master. My body needs to be a tuning fork. And if my body's out of tune or if I'm trying to take on an imbalance to be a counter corrector to an illness in another person, using an herb that carries that particular balance really, really helps me to become what I need to be in order to facilitate their rebalancing. Is this what you're talking about? Sure. That's definitely part of it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great way of putting it. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, I work with plants in a lot of different ways. One one thing I love to do is just work with trees. And if somebody needs a particular tree, yes, you can uh, make a tea or a tincture of the buds or the berries or the leaves, but you can also have someone just sit next to a tree. And I've seen amazing things happen. Uh, people who were clinically depressed just sit next to a tree and a uh, say, a, a very grounding tree like an oak. You just leave them there. And you don't even have to say a word. You just leave them there. And then within 15 minutes or so, they start to cry and they break down and all that stuff comes out. And you don't have to say anything because the tree knows how to do it. And there's another wonderful tree, the yew tree. If somebody has chemical poisoning and something that they haven't been able to clear out of their system, if they just sit with a yew tree, which, of course, yew is, is, a, is a poison. It's a toxic plant. Everything is poisonous except for the red flesh of the berry. But if you put a person who is poisoned next to a yew tree, the yew tree will rearrange their body and eliminate the poison. And I, I just love trees for that reason. It's like there's something, in it. of course, the Native Americans worship them because they call them the standing people. They reach to the heavens with their leaves, and they reach equally distant into the earth with their roots. And there's something about that connection between earth and sky that really promotes healing and balance in human beings. And I've seen so much hap magic happen that way myself. And speaking of magic, how do you relate herbology with magic? Well, it's, it's a form of magic. As we were saying, if you enter into a spiritual relationship with a plant, um, say you, you enter into a spiritual relationship with a living plant, uh, a tree, for example, that tree is going to be in communication with trees for 50 square miles around. You know, it can carry messages. There's certain, I mean, I have a book out called The Druid's Herbal of Sacred Tree Medicine, which goes into this in, in great detail. But uh, poplar trees, for example, are very good at carrying messages because of the way the leaves flutter in the wind. Uh -huh. And so you can send your intention out into the wind that way. Um, oaks are very good for grounding something because they the roots go down exactly as deep as the branches go high. Um, pine, of course, is, is great for bringing peace to a situation. Uh, I mean, they all, every one of these trees has a different quality. Hawthorn has these amazing thorns, which can be, you can, <laughs> I hate to say it, but you can actually, you can use the thorns to curse something, but you can also use the thorns to protect something. Hawthorn thorns, protect the heart. Uh, they're very protective, and of course the berries and the leaves and the flowers are very protective of the human heart, but the thorns themselves can be like a protective hedge around somebody's heart if their heart is broken. 
You know, isn't that the way with all herbs or everything for that matter, is there is no good, there is no bad. Everything can be used for either one. It's a matter of your intent and how you use it. Do you find you're able to speak to the trees? I try to listen to the trees, (laughs) yes. I do speak to them, but I mostly try to listen to them because I figure they know more than I do. Um, especially if I'm with a tree like a redwood, for example. I, I mean, I've had the experience of going inside of a sequoia, you know, and getting messages from the tree or, uh, yes, I get messages from trees. The way they send me messages is usually uh, through an image. They'll send me a picture of something and they don't speak to me in words, although there are people I know that actually hear voices, um, but I, I get images. That's how I communicate with them. So you, you get visual images? Visual images, yeah. What kind? It's kind of like, <laughs> well, they show me something. I'll, I mean, for example, I'll, the example of the sequoia. Um, when I went inside the sequoia, I lay down inside. This is in Muir Woods in California. And the, the tree started showing me these pictures. And uh, it was showing me the landscape all around, which was the, this yellow grass, which is wild oat. Wild oat is one of the Bach flower remedies, which is used for finding your purpose in life. So the tree was kind of showing me that's why people get attracted to go to California. That's why people keep going west. They keep, everybody keeps going west, or they used to, um, because the wild oat was pulling them uh, to find their purpose in life, you know. Um, the tree also showed me how the redwoods are in connection with the stars. That's why they're so tall. You know, the, all the action in redwoods is up at the top. You get this huge Just trunk amazing. and then the green. Uh, you know, I hate to do this. Time goes so fast, but it sounds like it's time for us to come to an end. This has been the Science of Magic. Remember, you can always listen to this and other thought-provoking episodes on our website www.thescienceofmagic.net Until next time, dear ones, may you be blessed with knowledge, comforted with love, and supported by our plant helpers.